Um, he originally started with an OLT seed project around the exams and from that has um, got a government funded project now transforming exams. Um, I'm working with Matthew as is my colleague Bruce White there um, and so, but Matthew's the key <laughs> presenter today and um, so I welcome him. But before we get started I'd just like to acknowledge the country. I'd like to acknowledge the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders who are the original inhabitants of the country. UniSA respects the Ghana, Boandik and Bargala people's spiritual relationship with their country. We acknowledge and respect their cultural heritage, beliefs and relationship with the land and acknowledge that they are of continuing importance to those people living today. We acknowledge the diversity of Aboriginal peoples past and present. So without any more introduction, I'll hand over to Matthew because he's going to tell us all about it. So thanks. Okay. Thank you. Um, welcome. Um, I'm a UniSA person from way back actually. I'm also an Adelaide Uni person and a Flinders Uni person as well. So um, I used to live in Adelaide for a long time. Okay, so um, this, this work has been going on, this e-exams project has been going on for quite some time. Um, it did start, um, I suppose it had its essence actually at Adelaide Uni under Professor Jeff Crisp when he was the head of their Central Teaching and Learning Support Unit. Um, and then it sort of grew up from there. Um, when I was at the uh, University of Queensland, we had a, um, a seed grant um, that started some of this work with uh, Dr. Andrew Fluck at um, at the uh, University of Tasmania. I should probably stick up the acknowledgements list of all the people who have been involved in this project, um, which is quite a lot because you know you can't do these things on your own. So whilst I'm the sort of the face of the roadshow in the workshops at the moment, um, there's all these people contributing and working and running trials and developing technology and all sorts of things in the background. So I really do want to acknowledge the fact that you know this is not a, a solo show. Um, Okay, so the prime motivation, I guess, of this work, um, as, as was the predecessor work with the transforming assessment series and webinars and stuff that we run, and they're still going, um, this work was, is about, I suppose, at its core, this gap between um, the increasingly uh, information technology rich society that we live in. Um, that includes you know, workplaces, personal lives, social lives, etc. And on the other hand, the way we currently do exams by and large. Now, since this project has started, there has been a lot more in the way of computerizing the exam room, um, particularly with you know, things like the University of South Australia's online program where they've started using um, uh, distance online proctored exams. Um, that sort of stuff wasn't happening in Australia when we began this project. So a lot has changed and a lot is beginning to change. I was at the uh, Examinations Network Conference over the last two days. And when I first went to that conference back in 2015 or something, new e-exams e were almost unheard of. I was the first person to present on that topic um, in, their, in their conference. This time they had five or six different presenters on that topic. And there was only a, you know, a single stream two-day co conference. So it's really come up a lot, um, and there are a lot of work being there's a lot of work now being done in Australia and around the world, I suppose, on on, on computerising exams. But our primary motivation, I think, we are a little bit different in that we started from what I call authentic assessment in inverted commas. So this idea of trying to fill the gap between, you know, um, the real world in inverted commas and the the fake world of the exam room, which is increasingly you, uh, divorced from that real world. How often do you have to sit in a room for three hours and all you have is a pen and a piece of paper to solve a complex problem? Right? Um, sometimes that skill is required, but it's uh, a very small percentage of your problem-solving environment. I mean, these days you are using complex uh, pieces of software, accountants using spreadsheets, uh, engineers using CAD software, etc. So, hence the primary motivation for this work. Um, the other side of it is, I suppose, is this, this idea of using technology to transform practice. So not just replicate what you do now. Now, I'd have to say a lot of 
the examination work that's been around uh, in recent times is, is largely about replication and a little bit of augmentation. That is, we use a computer, we basically take a paper-based ex paper exam or the kinds of questions you write in a paper-based exam and you stick them in a computer. Right? And you end up with text boxes, multiple choice questions, fill in the blanks because these replicate what you can do on paper. And that's a, an entirely reasonable thing to do as a first step. Right? Then what, what you might do is you say, okay, oh, computers, we can stick color images in. Woohoo! Right? And you know, you'll hear the vendors telling you're selling you their products. Look, you can have full color, high definition images in your medical histology exam. And that's a good thing. It's an improvement on where we were on you know, fuzzy black and white photocopies. So there's an improvement, but it's really just an augmentation. Because what we're doing is we're, we're giving you a high, more high definition version of the image. We haven't fundamentally changed the assessment yet. Right? But once we go above, above the dotted line, more interesting things can start to potentially happen. But it also means we need to start rethinking the way we write those questions, we write the assessments. Because if we want to take advantage of the affordances of technology, we need to start rethinking the assessment as well. Now, many of you are already using very interesting assessments in your, in your coursework. Right? You have students doing interesting projects. They use sophisticated software to produce results. They, they're probably quite creative. But at the end of the, end of the semester, we all know what happens. <laughs> I'm sorry, guys, you have to go and sit in that cold room over there or that hot room, and you have to write three hours with a pen. It's very inauthentic. Right? So what, again, this project is about is taking the, the affordances of what we're, we're already doing a lot of, increasingly anyway, in, in the classroom and allowing that to happen in the exam room as well. Um, just as a case in point, I suppose. Um, when we think about computerizing the exam system, this, this I suppose, is also representative of step one. Um, we have authentic writing tools on one hand, fully featured word processor. You know, you can integrate graphics, you can integrate um, uh, spreadsheets, you can integrate um, diagrams. But commonly what has happened is the computer vendors, uh, uh, computer exam vendors provide you with a, a screen, not dissimilar to this one, um, where they give you a text box to write in. So that's replicating the old fashioned, you know, blue book exam response sheet, you know, which is fine. Um, what it does allow you to do is read the handwriting. <laughs> read the writing. And we have found, anecdotally at least, there's a 20 to 30 percent increase in efficiency just by doing that alone in the marking time. You know, that's, that's already a good thing. So I'm not dishing this. What I'm saying is we don't stop here. Okay? That's not authentic assessment. Typing in a text box is not authentic assessment. It's moving us forward, but if that's as far as we go, I think, I think we've lost a trick. Similarly, look at what engineers might be using in practice. They'll use things like CAD software, right? Um, the thing on the right um, is not an authentic assessment for engineering. It's a valid assessment at a certain point in the education program, but you couldn't really call it authentic. Now, you might have the students doing authentic tasks and authentic projects outside of the exam room, right? But we all have heard about the um, contract sheeting problem. There is an OLT project going around at the moment. I went to their roadshow uh, uh, several months ago. Quite informative about you know, the, the things where students cheat and where they don't cheat and how they cheat and all the rest of it. Um, but it's happening. Um, their conclusion was it wasn't happening at a large scale, but they did ask the students whether they were cheating. So you might say, oh, is everybody going to stick up there? Oh, yes, I really did cheat, um, even if it was an anonymous form, right? Because you have to ask yourself, <laughs> you know, how many criminals uh, will uh, admit to being a criminal? Uh, not so many, right? So I think there is, there is this undercurrent there, um, and I'm not quite sure we're completely equipped to deal with it, to be honest. Um, I mean, countries like New Zealand have laws on their books that says cheating in university is actually illegal, illegal. In Australia, it's not. Now, you could potentially say it might be fraud, 
but good luck getting that through the courts. You know, um, would the university management even be brave enough to prosecute it? I don't know. So I think we need to take a different tact, tact use different tactics. And part of that is doing more authentic forms of assessment in the exam context. Because whilst we want our students to do rich, you know, authentic assessments, at the moment, those rich, authentic assessments are outside of the supervised context. And therefore, they are vulnerable to the, the outsourcing or the contract cheating problem. So what we do is we stick them in the exam room, but now we've got a problem of inauthentic assessment. Let's try and bring those two worlds together. And hopefully what we end up with is something that uh, has a higher level integrity around it, but also has the authenticity around it. Um, so I guess this is kind of this triad. <laughs> I probably should have stuck this slide up when I was talking about it. Um, so in us thinking about our work, um, this actually also, I've got another, I think I've got another slide later about the good, quick, cheap, pick two. <laughs> Uh, anybody heard of good, quick, cheap, pick two? No? No engineers in the room? No? So good, quick, cheap is a very well-known thing from the, from the engineering or the logistics areas where you've got constraints on the development of a product or a service. You can deliver high quality, you can do it quickly, or you can do it cheaply. But you, you can't have all three. So they, they, it's the iron triangle. Right? So you've got to think about where you want to put your priorities. Right? Now, if you think about it from a customer point of view, you're always going to want all three. You want it quick, you want it good, and you really want it cheap as well. But you're asking for something that's not really possible. Now, we can stretch the boundaries through using technologies. You know, technology can help to improve quality and efficiency. So that stretches and moves over time. But at any given point in time, there are, there are, there are uh, uh, constraints on what we need to do. And the way I've sort of thought about this is that in the assessment area, it looks something like this. We've got authenticity, integrity, and scalability. So authenticity is what we've been talking about. You know, is it good? Is it rigorous? Is it, you know, does it look real world? Is it really testing the student's knowledge? Um, integrity around, i.e. they can't cheat. <laughs> Um, and scalability, I suppose, is also about cost effectiveness. Is it doable in the real world of the funding and workload situation of higher education? You know, we can have highly authentic, highly integrity system. You know, if you think about work placements and, um, you, know, the pra you know, good practical laboratories and things like this, high authenticity, probably quite high integrity because you're identifying the individuals. But is that scalable for very large numbers? All right. Anybody think it's scalable? No, probably not, right? So what we tend to do, what's happened? You know, reduce the number of labs because they're expensive, right? So institutions make these decisions, and that's what they're doing is this kind of thing in the background. There's trade-offs to be made. So when you're constructing or thinking about, you know, moving assessment online, there's a similar kind of um, triad. I think I'll get to that. Okay, so there's. I'm getting ahead of myself. So scalability, integrity, all right? I'll just leave that there a bit because I've spoken about it. Um, so there was lots of things to think about. Um, if we're talking about computerized assessment, um, what is really, really scalable, online multiple choice questions, <laughs> automatically marked, easy to roll out, um, not very complex, but how authentic is that? Not very, all right? The other sort of thing that sort of comes in here is how you deliver the assessment over a network or in a lab where each student has an individual machine that's not connected to the network, right? Now networks make, networks by their very nature make things very scalable. But depending on how you're deploying it, so if you're on campus and you're deploying it, then the network actually now represents a single point of failure in an exam room, right? You imagine you're halfway through the exam. It's an online cloud-based exam. And the network goes down. What does that leave you? All right. Sorry, exam's over. Come back again next week. All right. But if we develop our systems with that reality in mind, we may be able to do something to overcome that. Now, there are some vendors out there that will allow you to run laptop-based examinations 
students download something before the exam, they come to the room. Um, and during the exam, there's no requirement to have a network connection. So thinking around how you can avoid the worst risks is also um, something that we've been exploring in this project too. We're not quite there yet, but I think we have a really uh, something to offer. I'll give you a pre cheap pre uh, here's the good quick cheap um, a preview later of that. So in terms of choosing an e-exam solution, now there are many ways to skin the cat, as they say, <laughs> um, but for us, we started at the authentic, we started at the good side of the triangle, right? Because I think a lot of people already provide the quick and the cheap. So as a differentiation point, I wanted to start at the um, authentic assessment angle, which is, I suppose, the, 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 um, uh, the background of the work with Jeff Crisp and myself at Adelaide Uni all those years ago. Um, and we wanted to continue that line of thought. Um, so quick essentially is, oh, can we implement it now? Is it really fast to get on board? Right? Does it require the institution to think about it too much? You know, I'll just buy the vendor's product, install it, away you go. Right? You can get such things. <laughs> Whether you want such things, I don't know. Cheap, again, you know, how much investment do you want to put into this? Investment is also, you know, is it administratively efficient? Is it cost effective? Does it cost a lot of dollars? Does it cost a lot of time? Right? Um, and of course, I've already talked about good. So when I said pick two, this really does happen. So quick and cheap, online multiple choice questions on a cloud-based server. Tick. Good? No, 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 no. Okay. Good and cheap? Yes, you can have it, but what do you sacrifice? Time. It will require you a long time to work through how you're going to achieve those outcomes, right? Because it requires a lot of thought, a lot of clever design to get good and cheap, <laughs> right? And in some respect, I suppose, our project has been trying to do good first, and then we've had to pick one. <laughs> What's our other one? Is it cheap or is it good? Well, the reality is I don't have much money, so it has to be cheap. <laughs> what I did have is quite a bit of time. So that's why this project has been taking a long time, because we've been slowly working through how to work towards a good but cheap scalable solution. Right? So that's you know, where I'm coming from with what I'll be you know, talking about. There's, there are choices, of course, in um, doing an e-exam or, or uh, e-assessment infrastructure. Do we do it online, do it offline? on campus or at distance. Sometimes you have to think about doing all of those things. Um, now traditionally, if you want to do off-campus exams, it was called a take-home exam in inverted commas. I don't like the word take-home exam because it's not an exam. It's a time-limited assignment and it has all the integrity problems associated with a non-supervised assessment. Right? But Having said that, you think about things like the online proctoring services that the UniSA Online are starting to learn and use. Now we have a solution that's possibly going to allow us to do take-home exams. Right? Now whether they have the same levels of integrity around them, I think remains to be seen. But it's certainly a step up from the traditional take-home exam where one gives it to the students and says, come back tomorrow. Who's to say they haven't got, you know, their, their contract cheating person ready to go, right? <laughs> so write it all for them, right? So at least with an online proctoring style service, um, there's a certain level of identity verification around those systems. So we're able to tell at least who's sitting in front of the keyboard, in front of the webcam. Now, there is some doubt around whether we can solve the unauthorized assistance problem because if you're using an older style computer on a desk, a $5 VGA splitter cable will undermine those systems. So you would have to then start thinking about what are the protocols around using those systems. Right? For that might be, for example, you're only allowed to use a laptop. Right? 
you have to do it in an isolated room. The only thing that can be connected to the laptop would be a power supply cable, right? So no external monitors, for example. Yeah. So there are extra steps you have to be aware of in the background because every time you introduce a new system, the students will figure out a way of cheating it. <laughs> and there are a lot more of them than there are of us. <laughs> so they've, they've, got, they've got the brain power on their side, <laughs> I might say. Right. Students are very creative people. <laughs> That's why we let them into our institutions. <laughs> yeah. So there are, as I sort of said, this, um, uh, this matrix that we thought about and these are the trade-offs. But again, there's always new technology coming along that may help stretch and move these things around. Um, so this, this is a picture of um, examinations, computer examinations being done at University of Tasmania. Now, Andrew Fluck at UTAS has been doing this stuff longer than before I came to the scene. Andrew is the real, I suppose, inventor of the concept, I guess, of using a uh, bootable Linux USB stick to run an exam. Now they don't use network. There's no network involved in that picture. Right? But I came onto the project and think actually we can use a network because it allows us to do interesting things with systems like Moodle. Um, he was using Word documents to run his examinations so the questions would all be in the Word document. The students would respond to the Word document. Um, it was a word processing document. It wasn't Microsoft Word, but it was still basically the same thing. Right? That's a great step one. It allows academics to prepare exams very easily because pretty much you all write your exams in Word anyway, right? It just goes to the printer. In this case, the document gets stuck onto a USB stick instead and the students will do it through their laptop. Right? So this project, as I sort of mentioned, is sort of targeting those areas. I differentiate between on and off campus because I think the solutions you'll roll out for those two situations could be quite different. Um, and again, when we started this work, um, the idea of using online proctoring perhaps is not quite so viable in an environment where um, internet connectivity outside the CBD is not great. <laughs> Right. Go 10 minutes down the road and generally it's quite bad. The NBN was supposed to solve all that. Unfortunately, we ended up with broadband, not broadband. Right? Um, a missed opportunity, but that's the story of Australia. <laughs> um, sorry, I'm being so <laughs> deprecating. Um, I'm an Australian, I can say these things. Um, so yeah, that's the target. Uh, on-campus exams, this, the context was the exam room or the in-class setting rather than students sitting at home. Now our roadmap for evol evolving along the way, um, some of you might have seen these diagrams before, that's fine. Um, the earlier part of the project, certainly phase one, that picture was essentially a phase one exam, Word document. You give students a choice as well. Um, what we did find in our research, particularly in the earlier days when I was doing um, quite a lot of phase one uh, exams at University of Queensland, a good one third of the students told me they preferred pen on paper exams. That surprised me because you would think that, you know, they're doing all of their assessments on computers pretty much, right? But especially, the problem is they train themselves to do exams. <laughs> They told me that they did um, deliberately wrote out their lecture notes using a pen because they wanted to practice for what's going to happen at the end of the semester. Now you think, OMG, why would they be doing this? This is a waste of their time. But you can understand why the students do this, right? And for those particularly, I had some very high performing students come to me and say, that, please don't make this compulsory because I've trained myself on a pen and I don't want to risk getting my sevens. Sevens was HD at UQ. So, you know, they've got this, I think what this tells me is change has to happen gradually as, as well for the students. It's, up, it's also incumbent upon the institution to help students transition. You could expect the transition period may take two or three years. 
if you come in the first year and you started writing exams and you got used to it, particularly since the high school system runs examinations using pen on paper, now they're changing too. You know, e-exams are coming. We've got NAPLAN online, although you know it's got teething problems. Um, the high school exams, I think, won't be far behind in many states. They're certainly looking at it. Um, so I think within a few years, I'm guessing we will have students coming into our institution where they don't do, didn't do pen on paper exam anymore. And what are we going to do? Ask them to train themselves to do pen on paper exams? Anybody think that's a good idea? Probably not, given you're in this room. But you know, um, <laughs> it's 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 a problem. Um, we have to we have to make a move on this. We can't. You know, time is I think starting to run out on this problem. From that point of view, okay. Phase two is maybe do keep doing the word document thing or the spreadsheet thing, but now we say, hey guys, everybody has to type because we're going to start using third-party software tools in the system. And we're going to start writing problems that you have to solve or can only solve using the third-party software tool. So you ask a computer programming student, oh my, OMG again, because at the moment they're writing out hand code on a paper, and that's the antithesis of the way you do computer programming, right? So that, they were the students who were most positive in the surveys about, hey, please give it to us yesterday. Um, but then there was other students in engineering and maths disciplines that said, um, not yet, because trying to do diagrams and trying to do maths formulas and things in a computer is still a lot more clunky than just quickly scribbling out a sketch on a paper. So different disciplines will be going at different speeds because the, the, the tools that they are using. Now, I did give the example of the CAD software before, right? But the way we teach students in the lower levels, particularly in, in engineering, is they teach them to sketch out things, you know, chemistry and biology, and they teach sketching, right? Quickly, just sketch your answer. But so in order for them to produce those kind of responses in the exam, at the moment, the software is not really well suited to it. So as I sort of said, anyway, so there's an example from, again, UTAS, Andrew, um, set up exams where the students would view pieces of multimedia and respond to it. They would have to write a small program in an application called Scratch. Scratch is like a, a, um, a software development environment intended for teaching or programming, particularly it's quite, getting quite popular in schools now. Um, so these were uh, IT education students. They had to write a small program and they handed in the program file. So the idea is the students can submit digital artifacts as part of their response. So they didn't write a text, they didn't type into a text box about, oh, I wrote a program and it did this. They actually submit the digital artifact for submission. Now, we do that all the time in, in, in during semester. Students are submitting assignments like that all the time, yeah? So the concept is not foreign to people. What is foreign is doing it under supervised conditions. Now, of course, that supervised conditions adds a layer of complexity because, you know, if things like networks go down during the class, you know, okay, let's do it next week or try again in 10 minutes. In the exam room, sorry, finished. <laughs> you know, so the conditions around making the technology work for the assessment is a lot tighter in the exam space. Then we go to something like phase three. Now, phase three is what we've been doing at Monash for the last um, six months at least. So I ran a couple of trials last semester um, in some Chinese language units um, where we used the Moodle um, as the exam environment. Now, the reason I think using the LMS is potentially a good idea is because everybody knows what it looks like already. They don't have to learn a separate interface just to do exams. So there's a continuity between what they do during semester and what they do in the exam room, which again is what we're trying to achieve here. Whereas if you use a third party exams tool, it may do things lovely, but you now have another barrier, a usability barrier to get over. Even if it's a simple to use piece of software, you don't have the continuity between 
the things that the students were doing in the LMS and the way they were doing it and the interface and the, how, how it all functions. You might think, oh, okay, students are learning software all the time. But I tell you, when we tried using LibreOffice and Microsoft Word, now these pieces of software, basically they're, they're both word processors, they function pretty much the same, but they look different. And the students were saying, oh, it's not the same. So that sort of gave me an indication that actually, even though you know, I could pick up LibreOffice, basically most of the functions were identical to Microsoft Word, um, but because there was this change, that sort of upset the students or put them off a bit. And remember, when people are under stress, their ability to solve even the simplest problems becomes quite difficult which is why user interface design is so very important in industries like airlines, nuclear power stations, right? Because, you know, when people are under huge stress, the system has to scream, press this button, <laughs> right? Everything about its design. So when we use authentic software in, in an examination, LibreOffice is an authentic software, it's a full office suite, but it doesn't quite look the same. And that sort of caused some of the students pause for, you know, oh, how do I do this or how do I do that? Now, we didn't get a lot of questions about it, but it came out in the comments. So I think there's something just to be aware of, which is why I personally would prefer that if we can use our LMS. Now, whether it's Blackboard, Canvas, or Moodle, it doesn't matter. But if we're able to provide that continuity, it's one less stress point for students. Um, the other two phases we haven't quite got to yet because the other two phases require a very robust network infrastructure to allow those to happen. Now, phase four is about giving students access to the internet in the exam. Anybody scared about that idea? <laughs> yeah, sounds scary. So phase four is about, we don't give them access to the entire internet. We only give them access to whitelisted or specific websites or specific resources. So we're able to do that by, by listing in the system which sites they should be able to access. If they try to go to facebook.com, just nothing happens. It's just blank screen. Right. So that's the idea. But if we're relying them to have, a, for example, the Australasian Legal Information Database, so if you're teaching anything to do with law, that's probably a good thing to have because all the history of the court cases, the all the state and federal legislation, the whole lot is up there on the web, all searchable. But the problem is, you know, at one hour and 45 minutes into the exam, the student wants to look something up. The network connection better be there, <laughs> right? So that's why phase four is actually a technologically just a little step further. We have, it's already working in our system. We can already do this. But because of the network reliability problem um, and because we're going for things like BYO laptops as a, as a strategy, um, part of the strategy. If you, were to, if you restrict com to computer laboratories completely and do not allow any other hardware in the room, you can probably do phase four now quite easily. But we run into the scalability problem of there's only so many labs on campus and there are so many more people wanting to do an exam at that same time. <laughs> so. Phase four is a little difficult for that reason. Phase five is even more brave. Now we let them look up whatever they like. <laughs> but we log and track everything. Right. Now you can imagine the kind of assessments that you have to write between phase one to phase four cannot be the same. Because you know we cannot have the type of question in, in phase one and two. And, for, and even phase three, we can have questions that potentially are Googleable. You know, you can look it up on the internet. Because you may be able to want students to recall a certain amount of facts. <laughs> now, we don't, of course, we don't want to stop there. We want to be up to higher levels of the taxonomy. But um, we can get away with those kind of questions because they can't. We've got a controlled environment. It's locked down. We're testing the student's memory of certain theories and concepts. But when we get to phase five particularly, we can't ask those questions anymore because they'll just Google them. What's the point? All right. 
We just so but what phase five does is it assumes yes, you've got the internet available. Because in the real world you have the internet available. <laughs> right? Whenever you guys have got problem, what do you do? It's Mr. Google. Hey Mr. Google, how do I solve this problem? I do it all the time. Right? Because the internet is essentially the world's knowledge base. Why would you not use that? You'd be insane not to. <laughs> so what we need to do is write different kinds of questions that assume they're going to be able to look up resources on the internet. Pull in those resources and use those resources to respond to our problem that we've set for them. Now the problem should be a lot more complex and wicked <laughs> because we're assuming they've got access to the basic lower levels of you know, the taxonomy. That's a different thing. That's a you know, kind of different world. I'm not quite sure a lot of people are ready for that yet. But hey, let's make it available and see what happens. Because I think we could get some really fascinating and interesting assessments out of that. If you write your assessment, the assumption that can look it up. Ah, here's the next thing. You know, call a friend. Right? Now at the moment, call a friend is illegal in exams. That's, that's called cheating. But in the real world, that's practice. Everybody does call a friend. Right? I've got a problem. Uh, oh, I know Joe Bloggs over in UNSW knows. He's an expert. I'll call him. Right? We do this all the time. So why do we not assess our students in their capability to pull in? So we might assess students on how they construct the questions of people they're going to ask, because we don't want to waste time. You know, asking good questions is a key to getting good things out of Google and getting good things out of helpers. Then the result comes back, an answer comes back. How do they integrate that into their solution? How have they integrated that knowledge effectively? Did they just copy and paste it and hand it in? <laughs> We hope not, <laughs> right? That is called plagiarism. <laughs> what we hope they do is they take the information just like they do in research and they integrate it into their own knowledge base and produce hopefully unique solutions and creative solutions based on that. Sounds like an assignment, doesn't it? Or what we hope an assignment to be, yeah? But because now we have it under supervised conditions, we can know where they're getting the information from and we know it's the student putting it together and not the contract cheating person putting it together for them under unsupervised conditions, yeah? So anyway, there's, that's the story. Um, what it looks like in our, in our software system, um, there's, there's a phase one exam. It's a um, demo Word document. Nothing fascinating there. But now let's introduce a PDF resource. Might be a data table. Could be a dictionary. Um, could be a whole lot of engineering schematics. Um, you know, could be a whole lot of law cases. But because they're in a PDF, at least they're searchable. <laughs> you know, if it's the e-text, e for example, it makes it searchable. No more of this, you know, stacks of books on, on the exam room desk. And then, you know, how many people are able to effectively use that stack of paper anyway? But the students are used to using Control F, <laughs> finding keywords, yeah? So again, you can ask more, more complex problems because you've now given them a searchable resource, even if it's offline. Um, you could give them multimedia resources. Um, you know, you want to know how to do something practical? YouTube is generally the first. You got, I fixed a washing machine. I'm not a mechanic, but I fixed one by watching some guy on YouTube doing it. Right? I saved myself $1,000. It took me... $20 and an hour's trip to Bunnings to get the part, but I was able to fix the problem because I watched a YouTube video. <laughs> now, people acquire knowledge through these kind of videos, so I think they're very legitimate sources of, um, you know, we're, we're putting videos on our courses increasingly now, right? Video resources, so they should be part of the exam. Um, I mentioned before about the Scratch programming environment. Um, but that could be any programming software development kit. It could be advanced mathematical software. Um, we've integrated about six different um, computer algebra systems into our platform. So in theory, you can set quite advanced math problems. Um, that's only a very recent uh, addition to our system. Um, but you know, Scratch, again, it's about getting somebody to do something that's more reflective of the real world and they submit 
a digital artifact. Similarly, we're talking about the third party software tools like CAD or whatever, um, same story there. We can also use simulations. So a colleague at Monash University, you might have heard of his work, the Chinese island. Um, it's a virtual Chinese learning language learning environment. He set up a city, a marketplace, an airport, all sorts of things in a 3D virtual world. And you can go in there and do task-based language learning activities. You can do transactions. You can ask people for directions. Now, that is a, a reasonably authentic learning environment. It's not as authentic as sending, giving somebody an air ticket to Shanghai. But certainly, it is a lot cheaper. And it's probably more scalable. So if they've been using this language learning environment during the semester, and in his courses they have, why could we not give it to them in the exam as well? <laughs> yeah, at the moment that's very difficult, but if we have a delivery platform that allows us to do that, um, all sorts of interesting things become possible. As I said before, the learning management system um, really should be involved in here because um, a lot of the cases we can put, we can integrate. At the moment, with a standard Moodle system or a standard Blackboard system, they're not meant to run exams, and they don't work very well as exam environments on their own. They need something around them to give you that layer of integrity and layer of control. Um, so that's also something we've been working on, is how a first example is how can we make Moodle behave like an exam system. And again, we ran some trials this semester, and I think we were reasonably successful at that. Um, Multi-language capability is something that our platform already has, because um, we also ran language translation exams. And we have a side project with NATI, National Accreditation Authority of Translators and Interpreters. So we run translation, uh, language translation exams in the system too. OK, so here's a. Um, overview, a very, very high level helicopter view of the trials we have run uh, for this phase of the project. Um, there's been over 20 separate trials. Most of them have been relatively small. Um, our limited resources means that we have not really been able to scale to a large, large exam. Yeah. OK, all right. So most people were happy with it. That's the, <laughs> that's the conclusion to that one. Um, there were some research questions. Did, 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 this is how it works. Now, we'll go through this in the workshop. Sorry? I'm sorry. No, no, that's fine. <laughs> I often blabber on for too long. That's fine. But we're running the workshop this afternoon. So those of you who are at least on site will be able to come and um, we will play a bit more with this. That's a sort of a high level overview again with a bit more detail of how we run the Moodle based exams uh, in semester one this year. Um, that's kind of the way the system works. This is a picture of a student using our Moodle based uh, system from a USB stick that connects to, the, to, a, to a Moodle server. Um, there's a picture of the students using it in our fantastic new teaching and learning building. Um, it's fantastic from my point of view because most of the tables have power sockets in them. <laughs> um, and if there's anything that computers really, really need, that's electricity, <laughs> funnily enough. Um, so students bring laptops in, but you can't be sure that they're going to last for the duration of the exam. So having a decent number of PowerPoints in the room allows them to plug in should they need to. Um, this is what one of the pages looked like. Moodle on the left, uh, third party application on the right. So you can move things around. The third party ap application was a um, Chinese dictionary translating tool thing. Um, there is another picture of a you know, piece of thing. Now, the next bit was, remember I mentioned the network as a single point of failure problem. Um, what you don't want is the computer to go glitch and, oh crap, I've lost the half an hour worth of work. Um, and that can happen if you're not careful. Now, Moodle has a setting where it will you allow you to auto-save the responses to the server every one minute. And that's great, whilst there's a network. <laughs> um, if there's no network, uh, we're in trouble now, right? But with our system, we have developed a uh, plugins or extra pieces of code that allows the system to redirect that auto-save onto the USB stick in an encrypted file. 
which means you've got double layers of backup. When the backup or the backup fails, you know, you've got at least the version on the USB stick. Similarly, um, here's a whole lot of results. Um, I'm clearly not going to be able to get through any of that. Um, let's explore it in the workshop. Um, but some quick key findings were people like the exam system in general. Um, you can't please all the people all the time. Um, I think that goes without saying. Um, the robust network features of the latest version did work. Um, on one or two students, they lost their Wi-Fi connection. Um, on one student, we can get the Wi-Fi back. Um, on one student, we couldn't. Under normal circumstances with Moodle, that's game over. With our system, it's no worries, just keep going. <laughs> you get the encrypted file off the USB stick at the end, you upload it to Moodle, and it's just seamless. So that worked really well for us. Um, as I mentioned before, time saving on marking. Um, obviously, those kinds of tasks where there's lots of chicken scrawl on paper, that's where the big savings is immediately. Of course, if you have selected response, convergent response items on a quiz, the computer can mark those, provided you set up your you know, expected answers properly. Um, but you know, there is always um, a learning curve with writing things like expected answers into convergent response. Selected response is easy. The pro, you, know, you just configure Moodle or Blackboard or whatever, um, and it will mark it. But if you have a small text box and you're asking students to type things into it, sometimes they type unexpected things into the box. <laughs> so you know, sometimes there can be a bit of an iterative process when you do your marking to build up your marking key. Um, what was the last one that was there? Um, that was the um, yeah percentage of students that still preferred paper. Now, when we did the Moodle stuff, that wasn't so prominent. But when we did the earlier stuff with um, typing optional Word documents, there seemed to be a reasonably consistent 30%. 30% were pro, yes, please, let's have it. We love it. 30% were, nah, I don't care, either way. But there was this, so we've got 60%. <laughs> Uh, captured, that's fine. It's that remaining 30% of the um, population that we do need to care about. We can't just say, oh, your laggards, blah, 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 too bad, so sad. You know, these are our students. We need to care about them. We need to help them transition. So, yeah, okay. Um, question time. Yeah, questions in the room from the mic. I'll ask you just to give your name and institution. No? There's one at the back. Any questions online? <laughs> okay, yeah, cool. Uh, thanks, thanks very much. I think this session is really timely and the project's really timely. I think all unis are looking at how, you know, how they can move into this space, not, not only providing e-exams, but also, you know, a lot of unis thinking about how they can make assessment more authentic at the same time. Yeah. Um, I guess one of the, it's sort of a question, sort of a comment, it seems like there might be um, a sort of implicit assumption that exams are inherently more secure than other forms of assessment. Um, and you mentioned the OLT project, I'm glad you did because um, I'm on that project. Cool. And, uh, <laughs> and, um, and one of the things we found um, in, in our surveys was that um, exam cheating was more common than any other kind of cheating, uh, even more than, you know, getting help on a take-home assignment. Mm. And so exams seem to give universities a really false sense of security. We assume they're secure, but you know, Maddie McMaster's work at the University of Melbourne has been showing just how insecure they are at all the various stages of the exam prep process. Oh yes. Um, so yeah, it's it's interesting. Um, but I think one of the really interesting things that student that the data told us was that there's a really strong link between authenticity and integrity in exams. So students told us they cheat in exams for two reasons. One, it's easy, uh, especially when they're multiple choice questions because the questions tend to stay the same from year to year. So students share banks of questions from previous years, they memorise them all and yep. then they walk in and regurgitate. So, and they sit next to each other and they chat. You know, they tell us how easy it is to cheat in exams and we're kind of blind to that. 
But the second reason they tell us they cheat in exams is they feel exams are inauthentic and they don't reflect the real, real world. They say, if universities don't care enough to assess me in a way that's going to mean something to me, you know, when I get out into the real world, then why should I care about integrity? I'm just going to cheat. Um, and I think the other interesting thing too in relation to detection, uh, detecting cheating in exams, was we are totally blind to cheating in multiple choice question exams. But the moment an exam flips into any form of writing, even short answer questions or essays under exam conditions, our detection rates leap up above the cheating rates. You know, cheating goes down, detection goes up. So actually, we're really good at detecting cheating in writing, you know, when we see the quality of a student's work rather than a tick box thing. So I think so much of what's happening here in relation to authenticity is so valuable for improving the integrity of exams as well. Mm, yeah. um, I'll just comment on the, yes, I agree. Um, I agree with everything you said, <laughs> so that's good. Um, I mean, I think we do exams in part because it's cultural. You know, we do it because we do it. We have this perception that they are high, you know, high stakes integrity. Um, I would have to say that some of that this problem is maybe we don't run exams as good as what we could as well. Um, you know, the invigilator to student ratio is getting wider and wider and wider as we try to save money. Um, is another problem. Um, giving everybody the same multiple choice questions, even on a paper-based exam, are you crazy? Um, <laughs> You can, you know, every third seat can have a different, the same questions, just in a different order. Now, when you introduce a computer, if, you know, every LMS has got the random question and random distractor options, turn them on. Um, you know, there are simple things I think we can overcome, the low-hanging fruit, as it were, um, in that respect. Um, stopping students from communicating to each other in the exam, I, that comes down to, Invigilation skills, you know. Um, so I, yeah, you're right. The system's not perfect, um, but and we can certainly do better on many fronts. So yeah. So th thank you very much for your comment. Um, any anybody else? Um, hi, my name's Claire Toll. I'm from the SACE board. We're actually um, South Australia for the first time in the nation this year in November. We'll do Year 12 electronic examinations using a lockdown browser. So we're leading out, and I agree with all of that. Um, in, in our, in our, we're wanting to move pretty quickly to, uh, to phase four, phase five, um, but the community aren't quite ready for that. Um, but yeah, um, we don't currently write examinations in the way that actually reflect to provide the student the opportunity to show their learning. For us, an A plus student isn't necessarily the student that gets 20 out of 20 every, you know, yeah. every assessment throughout the year. So we have to change that, and we have to start with the teachers, we have to start with the academics to change that sort of uh, assessment writing, so we can get that um, coming through for students. Yeah. Um, as somebody who works in a central academic development unit, I wholeheartedly agree. Um, you know, that it's not just dump technology in, in, in the system and expect everybody to make the most of it. Unless there's professional development for teachers and academics and, you know, and learning designers and all these people who make our system work, um, you know, it's just another shovel. You know? <laughs> and most people don't like digging holes. So, you know, there is... You, you, there has to be a holistic approach to doing this. And I suppose every time we've introduced a new piece of technology, we, we keep having the same problem. You know, Every time a new piece of technology comes along into education, it's the same year old problem. Let's stick computers in the classrooms. Let's put LMSs in the, in the university. Let's do online webinars. Let's do recorded lectures. All right? But all these tools have affordances that are you know, not being taken advantage of because the people in our system don't have the knowledge to do that. It's normal. I mean, especially in universities, we hire accountants and engineers and chemists for very good reasons because they're great researchers. But they're not necessarily trained in curriculum design. This is not a, pro this is not a blame. This is the reality. So it is really incumbent upon the institutions to, to recognise this problem. Yeah, they have academic central development units, but if you think about how compulsory is that, how part of the hiring decision is that, you know, pedagogical knowledge. They have the content knowledge, but do they have the pedagogical knowledge? And the next thing is, do they have the technology? You know, the old TPAC framework. You know, people, some people are familiar with that, yes. But that has lessons for us to think, you know, you need a rich source of knowledge to do modern education well. So, 
Thank you for that comment. Yeah. Any online Any comments? No, I'm trying to move on. <laughs> okay, all right. <laughs> No, we want to record it. So, yeah. Um, Wendy Foster from Flinders Uni. Um, I just had a um, quick question. Um, with your phase five, you talked about having, you know, free for all access, um, internet access, and I think, um, you know, looking at phase four, um, I'm in um, midwifery program, so um, health sciences, nursing, um, and I know that, you know, in practice, we would encourage, stu um, you know, students, practitioners to use. Um, clinical guidelines which are available so I can see mm. in that phase four giving them access to those guidelines to you know prompt their um, you know in, in practical based questions I think that would be really beneficial but going back to your um, good quick cheap kind of thing there if we went to phase five with that to kind of see well what what resources are these students going to like to answer these questions when I think about how quick it would be to moderate that, so if I'm assigning, you know, grading to how they're, uh, which resources they're directing mm. themselves to, you know, as, have you got any suggestion about that? If you're, because I think that would be a really great, a really great, in essence, to say, wow, these students are going so far from the resources that we would encourage them to use to guide their practice. You know, but it would it could take an astronomical amount of time to go through that if we're moderating the yeah. right. I mean, yeah, it's not necessarily going. To, as I said, good is not necessarily going to be quick. Um, but on a plus side, that sort of thing could inform your teaching as well. At the moment, we don't know what they look up other than the reference list that they stick on the bottom of the essay or the report. Um, and do they even look at half those resources? We don't know. Um, do they just go to Wikipedia and then write some books down they found in the library instead? Uh, we, don't, we don't know at the moment. Uh, we just assume that they you know, read and consult the resources that they, they cite. Um, <laughs> but um, you know, I think this, this question of closing a loop with respect to you know, resources and indeed feedback to students, I think e-exams have a potential here. Um, some, you know, learning analytics and stuff like this is much, you know, spoken about recently. But um, I think it's all going to, I think we're going to fail to achieve the promise from learning analytics because at the moment we have lots of little buckets of information that are very much disconnected from each other. Um, the biggest bucket that's not connected at all, any way, way, shape or form, is the examination because it's all pen on paper. And whilst in theory we have access to that information, it's not economically viable to use it because it's all written on different bits of paper. We'd have to spend half a year going through it all and collating it and da da da. But if that's all in an electronic format, I think we've now got access in a more economic way to start using. So your idea of using, that's the idea. I think closing that loop between what are they doing, that will inform your teaching for the next semester as well. And indeed, if you think about what is an examination, what's supposed to be the sum or an evaluation of the student's knowledge at a point in time at the end of the unit or the end of the course. Why that cannot be the gateway or the diagnostic assessment for the next semester. So I think I'm getting the wind up. So yes. thank you very much. Okay, thank I'd like you everyone <laughs> yeah. to thank Matthew for a very thought provoking session. <laughs> and look forward to many of you joining Matthew in the next session in GK three twenty eight, is it? Three twenty eight. Yeah, that's right. a familiar room I used to teach in it years ago. <laughs> so thanks again, Matthew. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Oh, the last thing is don't forget our uh, symposium on 24th of November in Melbourne. We're bringing over a couple of speakers from Europe, so that might be of interest to some people. So, thank you again. <laughs>